So, Mr. Gubinski, uh, we will see him definitely today, uh, one more time, at least uh, for the other lecture, but uh, to give him a little bit of time to take a rest, I will tell you now what is new in our case, uh, case law and practice. In this seminar, we have a wonderful opportunity to hear overviews as Mulendal, Mr. Mulendal is talking about case law in Europe. And then we also have reviews and we will have them tomorrow about the EU IPO. Uh, so intellectual property appeal uh, office um, practice. And then also today on the issues in Latvia, then tomorrow we're going to have also about our neighboring countries and interesting rulings there. And let us hope, uh, well, actually we hope to see Mr. Grabinski in Unified Patent Court uh, practice. Uh, that is what we're going to see. Uh, probably we're going to have this opportunity. But now about the topical issues in the Latvian intellectual property case law. And I have only 30 minutes, but I will tell now what it is, what are the tendencies in the IP cases, and especially those which go to Senate. It's not one issue, it's several um, issues, several law issues, uh, material, procedural, and um, then the scope is rather broad. Uh, but I have chosen to present about four cases, and uh, the four cases are the practice of the Senate. It does not mean that in the regional court, district courts, there are no interesting cases. I would say they are even very interesting, considering the fact that there are also uh, Board of Appeal decisions that are being challenged. So the final instance is uh, Riga District Court, but there is anyways very interesting in case law developing uh, in 30 minutes it wouldn't be even possible for me to tell everything but two very interesting cases I want to tell you one in regional court one in district court and then uh, ended and tomorrow uh, my colleague is going to tell about them but uh, now about the four rulings from Senate practice uh, what I need to say that uh, the first thing I want to talk about I think it's very fresh as fresh as it could be Mm. The ruling is six days old. It's last Wednesday. And I'm not going to say, well, these are, uh, well, I'm not going to say about the claimant and uh, what the defendant said uh, or what they claimed. Uh, in essence, I will not be speaking about this case. We sent it over for a new review and the court is going to have to look into it once again. But there are material. The, judicial aspects and the Senate uh, did express their opinion. The defendant does not uh, acknowledge the infringement, but uh, as I said, they will going to be writing about the infringement once again, or not once again, but they will uh, continue, need to, to be writing. So I will not be uh, talking about the assessment as such, but the defendant did not, uh, I mean, well, there was some kind of correspondence and uh, he did not uh, he did not reject that he had used the sign or basically this uh, logo they say we do not admit the infringement but we are going to or we are ready to change it as much as it is related to the use of that particular shape and this was probably the only evidence uh, in this uh, in this in this case. So after such correspondence, after several weeks, the claimant then goes to court, and uh, the dispute, uh, the subject of the dispute, was whether the infringement was uh, was uh, uh, was mitigated, and uh, what is the burden of proof on whom it lies, and how can you prove that this use was during the uh, raising of the claim. And then Senate admitted this is correct, as uh, lower instance courts did admit that this is the claimant's uh, uh, this is a claimant's responsibility. And the dispute was whether the rights were infringed and whether rights were violated and whether what the claimant is claiming is this uh, being assessed on its merits or the court should exclude them from um, evidence. 
so typical to Latvia than uh, a couple of things, as uh, mainly the listeners are from Latvia and what could be useful, is that since 2020, in force, we have new injunction uh, law. And before that, we saw that uh, the name of the claim or the subject of the claim uh, there were variations, uh, whether it's on infringement, on uh, terminating the infringement, or uh, and so versions were several. And then the task force and the lawmaker then agreed that all these requirements we call we call right for uh, right for removal of the infringement of the rights. And uh, we chose this uh, wording in particular. So those are who are uh, writing the rulings, then they should use this. So then one procedural aspect that was interesting is that uh, licensees rights to raise a claim. This is uh, Article 51, Part 2 uh, on trademark law is that says that uh, there is a right to raise a claim with uh, with the uh, uh, with trademark owner's permission consent and so the, the the defendant said that this is not the consent and it is not like power of attorney formalized and this is why the court uh, explained very correctly that it's not has to be it doesn't have to be a power of attorney as we understand in civil law and in, um, in regards to civil procedure law consent is not power of attorney so power of attorney is uh, authorizing a certain person but licensee then in his name or in their name um, is uh, raising the claim on the permission that does not have to be power of attorney so it has to be uh, distinguished so what about the uh, time frame of proof and uh, interesting is that um, the claimant did apply for uh, they did not uh, apply for they did not apply for compensation but the injunction and um, for which we have also provided for by the law this is article 54 paragraph 1 and definition in the paragraph 55 part 1 if you regularly visit this event or uh, review such cases that you might know that we have already uh, more than 10 years of um, like we didn't have a term for injunction in Latvia and it wasn't even in lib um, in dictionaries but um, there's now there is now term injunction and uh, since 21 and it's also found in law uh, trademark law and uh, the Senate has already defined that uh, in several such decisions uh, but now uh, this is also this also has legal definition and now about the infringement uh, the, itself, uh, where the court, uh, it was a district court which made this uh, mistake, there was a necessity to find the correct time frame when the infringement occurred. So when, identifying when, since when to, until when the infringement was uh, conducted. So for that it is important when you are claiming the compensation and one of the uh, characteristics of assessment than it is but in this case they wasn't asking for this so it was uh, important to establish that they did infringe once again I said as at the day of claim that there was even such um, infringement uh, occurring and then it and Senate already before SKC 318 uh, uh, then says that this injunction can be applied in primarily three cases if the infringement or violation is ongoing or continuing secondly if this infringement was uh, present but is uh, terminated but there is uh, grounds to believe that it may continue or if the infringement does not occur but the trademark owner uh, rights can be infringed or there's a possibility in the future that it is violated so there are some preparation uh, steps already occurring and it is necessary for uh, the defendant to stop uh, doing 
their activities. And in order to define these preconditions, the court had to establish the fact of the violation. And the third case, this is the preparation activities we were talking about, but not its um, well how long it took place. And so another thing that needs to be said is that um, regarding the proof, the claimant did apply electronically a screenshot and uh, printouts from uh, defendant's uh, Facebook page and also from their home page. Well, the question was then uh, whether this uh, evidence is admissible and how they should be formalized. Uh, I must say, the court made a mistake because they said that only with sworn notary or notary at law it can be uh, certified, such uh, uh, such evidence. Yes, if it is being done, that it has higher credibility. However, on admissibility, it does not impact it really. And what we solved in this case was what we were solving is that uh, our civil procedure law, Article 95, then uh, admits so printouts and screenshots of the website correspond to the concept of written evidence, and accordingly, uh, it has to be like different from the uh, challenging. So, let's say the defendant says. Uh, it challenges the saying that, for example, you can uh, falsify such information, and nowadays especially, uh, because we didn't know or we do not know how the claimant is actually uh, submitting it. And once again, then uh, from 95, uh, what is the distinction? Uh, this is uh, stipulated by the law, and uh, screenshots and what or printouts, uh, are they admissible? But the article 178 about uh, challenging, uh, then this uh, not only relates to IP cases, but also in other cases, it has to be distinguished again, this 95 or 178, whether it's counterfeit. So, as said previously, that this is like a milder form, so to say, and the uh, patent office uh, president said so previously. But... Um, the Senate also maintained that the burden of proof is and the evidence is real and correct, but the burden of proof is on the claimant's side. So, and and once again, it has to be indicated that, for example, defendant defendant cannot just say you can do a lot nowadays with a computer. Well, it's not no, it's not a dispute of this proof and admissibility. Uh, you have to say what was incorrect in that particular evidence or in reality maybe on their homepage something else was actually published so they have to draw the attention to and see what are they proving and what they can be proving and so when the claimant was uh, or submitted the day uh, the files with metadata which uh, said at what date the uh, materials were prepared, so created, and the court had to analyze whether it is um, evidence uh, admissible or not. And then, if it is uh, real evidence, then, or if it is a correctly formalized evidence, then the burden of, of uh, evidence or uh, explanation then is on the defendant. And if they do challenge that it is not real, then uh, upon analysis of the met metadata, uh, once again, uh, technical means of influencing the evidence has to be reviewed how technically possible how uh, much they can do and if claimant is even interested in uh, I don't know amending or counterfeiting the data the metadata which is um, under the review and under dispute so this is how they also review the credibility um, of the particular materials Tomorrow, uh, Andrei Stets from uh, European uh, Court of Justice is going to be talking about e evidence, so we're definitely going to hear about this topic more. Now, next ruling, it's not even a year old, it's uh, last year, in, in the end of last year. Uh, closed proceedings, you cannot see the date, unfortunately, or not, but uh, this full number. But with SKC 22, that's basically it can be found in the case law archive of the Supreme Court. And that is Air Baltic Corporation against uh, Baltic Taxi uh, about um, admitting invalid of their trademark. There are three aspects. It was sent back to regional court. I will not be speaking about all the aspects. And it actually returned to Senate uh, already. So 
well, I can say about three very interesting aspects about this case. So first of all is the trademark families. I I do not even remember when or or at least it's not been a lot of cases so it could be the first one to come into senate is that uh, trademark um, trademark families uh, and 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 how in the case of these trademark groups or families and what we establish and in air baltic case then there were these um, names air baltic uh, the name itself meaning and uh, the green color which uh, we can all associate uh, to something in latvia probably and the uh, figure <coughs> figurative signs which are more than 20 of them registered uh, without going um, further into the de into detail i just showed you uh, where the dispute is And so the Senate analyzed how much you can confuse in case of the family and then there has to be some uh, evaluation of the possibility of confusing compared to uh, the signs of the defendant and whether there are such qualities that can link it to the particular series uh, uh, giving a, a wrong uh, interpretation from the user. And it is important then that the defendant really had uh, lots of these signs and such uh, such uh, comparison or analysis has to be performed on all of them. Um, then again, uh, this bad faith, and uh, we already talked about, but uh, after the coffee break, there's going to be more about that. There's going to be a lecture and and discussion but i will tell one thing also in relation to the bad faith is that if the claimant has claimed the trademark with bad faith but also there there was an interesting question that the claimant uh, so the defendant initially okay so once again the initial registrar of the trademark not the claimant but defendant they already passed them over to another owner so the new defendant can it even be claimed about invalid trademark because the uh, because the registration application was submitted in bad faith because in our particular case there was no person to register that would not be the defendant in this case and then court said yes mm there is uh, some kind of there's no uh, limitation but if the question is about the trademark itself can it be then registered and valid can it remain so not only against the person who submitted but um, but upon developing on this thesis then the senate uh, also referred to the european uh, case law that um, when you are again uh, transferring it to third party that it wouldn't be possible so it is possible to be claiming from this new third party and if you do familiarize yourself uh, with this decision you will find the conclusions and one more of i want to um, remind it is the um, claim of the damages linked to the directive which was mentioned uh, about uh, previously uh, both Mr. Mulandal and uh, Mr. Grabinski about application of the property rights um, so the injunction can be applied also to in innocent infringers but but regarding the damage claim it's not uh, it's not the case and there are no exemptions that again you can only ask for damages or uh, compensation of the damages of the person that would be aware of infringing the rights next decision uh, very interesting situation there i'm not going to go once again through all the issues but uh, they are rather complex, very long questions, and also these um, law questions um, or judicial questions, rather broad. And even if you look at the thesis, then it was very 
difficult even for me to choose which theses even to highlight in this case, but I think there are four or five of them also in the case law database. You can familiarize yourself with them. But what is um, unique about this case is because um, talking about uh, representatives of other countries also, you, we discussed that um, both previously, and uh, it was discussed, and I was asking whether there are other member state justices who has uh, faced such situations, but um, in the network last year in Europe, uh, we discussed it with the colleagues, and, uh, and, and now mentioning several colleagues, uh, and we discussed if there were such situations, and then, and then we concluded that not in in no other member state. They did not admit that they would even have such a situation as it was in our case. And very briefly, so basically the claimant is a small Latvian company uh, which is uh, offering some burial services. And, uh, and uh, the defendant was a large Lithuanian uh, shopping center chain, basically, or the owners. Okay, the trademark Acropolis. So this uh, center is in Latvia, but this is about the time when it was not in Latvia. So the services by the Lithuanian companies were not conducted uh, in Latvia with this trademark. And this case is interesting also from that aspect that the question is whether and in what cases you can just broad representation transition from one country to another. Okay, so territorial spill spillover of reputation. So, and what has to be proven to the court and what the uh, court has to analyze. Uh, from UK, my colleague Richard, he said, and regularly if you go to these seminars, he once was also in seminar in, in, in Jurmala, I remember 18 or 19, and uh, also referred to him because part of uh, you know him. Yeah, he told that uh, there had been a case uh, in case of goods, uh, this, this uh, spillover, but for us it was services. So what, which criteria does the applicant have to prove and what should the court assess? So this uh, reputation and uh, spillover of reputation from one country to another in national trademarks when uh, in the respective countries, this uh, trademark is not being used. Uh, uh, these are really um, uh, these uh, legal norms we had to assess, uh, uh, national norms, but with regard to uh, regulations and directives, uh, where there were judgments of uh, EU court, uh, so we could uh, use these uh, judgments. Uh, and in this case, uh, we have to understand that there are no similar uh, goods and services. Services are different, uh, burial uh, services uh, and services is provided by a shopping center, they really are different. And it is more simpler when the uh, services or uh, goods are similar. Here we clearly see difference. And also here uh, on the uh, pra uh, uh, practice of the uh, European court and also Latvian Senate uh, uh, established, um, so when in, in cases when we do not have similar uh, goods uh, and so to have this uh, protection of which criteria should be uh, present so the applicant's earlier mark uh, should be well known on the relevant date in relation to certain goods and services then the question does the relevant public see a link between the earlier well-known mark and this uh, later mark uh, also whether the use of the later mark causes uh, damage uh, uh, we also found similar cases. Uh, it will be one of the next slides. It will not go through, but I am just mentioning that this criterion is one of the slides. And then also whether the, uh, so whether the use of the later mark causes damage to the distinctive character or reputation of the earlier mark, or whether the defendant takes undue advantage of the reputation of the earlier mark owned by the applicant and also whether the defendant had a valid reason for using this mark. So the first three should be uh, proven by the uh, applicant and the fourth for defendant. And then the, when he says that I have uh, grounds, but then uh, how to establish this uh, spillover if uh, these uh, uh, services are not being used in the respective country, then uh, there should be a well-known, uh, but not even not used so well-known trademark uh, in a part of Latvia, so for Latvian uh, people, so there should be a, 
uh, aware of this trademark of Lithuania before it was being used here. Of course, right now we all are well aware, so we have this big shopping mall here, uh, two of them. But at that time, uh, then what was established? Uh, so it was. Uh, so uh, we uh, had to uh, see so the, this uh, uh, well-known uh, uh, aspect, so whether it is due to tourism or uh, advertising, uh, or it is, uh, and it is also not uh, over-inclusing uh, aspects of also the uh, sales of uh, goods in uh, t uh, different uh, places, so the duration, scope, geographical range of promotion of the mark, also the publicity and the media, also the uh, special marketing strategies, promotion of goods and services by these uh, influencers or uh, podcasts in another country, and also advertisements. And this all is related to the aspect of language. So uh, if it is uh, for this uh, uh, people close to border of Latvia, uh, border, so Latvian and Lithuanian languages are uh, uh, more uh, the only uh, live uh, Baltic languages. Uh, they are uh, uh, related to each other, but you cannot understand uh, very well. So, so, so we we can uh, perceive a separate word, but uh, when we speak, we do not understand. So we cannot uh, read or uh, listen. Uh, so maybe people who are living close to borders. So all these could be criteria to assess and. Uh, uh, and I also wanted to, to mention that uh, it is uh, it was very interesting to establish that uh, EU member states uh, do not have uh, equal and similar attitudes. So how do you establish when uh, the uh, trademark is well known? Is it a uh, motives or, or it is in this uh, in which part of uh, and we are. Uh, we are uh, assessing this and how we are writing uh, judgments and uh, uh, how what we were put in which uh, part and we understood uh, that this uh, 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 so it is, uh, the trademark is uh, acknowledged as invalid or but uh, they do not but uh, uh, do not recognize the trademark as uh, well known. And so also, so this should be proven and a proven aspect, and it could be also a, another case where the parties can prove uh, more or prove uh, less, and then we can establish uh, something else. And the last case, which I would like to mention, uh, but just uh, yeah, will not uh, tell in detail, also about databases, about protection of databases, and it was the uh, first time uh, when we spoke uh, how to uh, differentiate uh, situation with databases, so databases can be protected uh, by uh, uh, copyright or so the suit generis uh, rights. And how do you see difference? Uh, so when it is uh, suit generis rights and when it is copyright, and also uh, it was uh, discussed about the assessment of database uh, creators, and uh, hopefully we will have this uh, CV on online. Uh, Case which has been already in the EU court, and some scientists say this is a new era for protection of database, and we will have to come back to that case, uh, uh, Riga uh, Regional Court, and this was a question, uh, and uh, we got an answer, and now the case is back uh, with us, and we will see, this will be really interesting, and uh, we will see what uh, happens uh, and what we will hear uh, in the future. And also here, it, uh, it was emphasis on uh, commercial uh, right, commercial uh, secret protection. Uh, quite often uh, we hear about this in the Senate. And uh, yes, if uh, there is uh, the question of uh, commercial secrets, then, uh, then we also have uh, stated that in every case, the court has to uh, uh, assess according to this uh, article 2 and 3 of commercial law whether this is really commercial secret and this is not only a uh, statement of the uh, uh, applicant, uh, this is uh, also this also should be uh, proven. So I think that these are the most interesting cases of uh, late. Uh, so thanks for your interest, and uh, I wish you success uh, also in the future. But you will see me again today.